that not only is God fully available to you, but he is counting on you to count on him. And you are not the only person that suffers when you choose not to lean into God. Everything around you, every task that he's placed in your hand, from the people that you're working with to the future that you want to design to, you know, for your career or otherwise, he already has it all laid out and you're going to delay it, which means there are people that are waiting for you to show up and be that will be delayed in something else. There are, there's so many things tied to our being. And there are days when I'm showing up and I'm like, I have to remind myself, it's not just about me. Welcome to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal, your weekly gathering of Black women and femme spiritual leaders, teachers, healers, and medicine folk from across the African diaspora. I'm your host and guide, Laren Alta, medicine woman, teacher, healer, and mystic. My intention is to create a sacred and sovereign container for you to more deeply explore yourself and your divinity so that you can tap into your spiritual gifts and live your soul's purpose. Sound good? Excellent. Let's do this. You're invited to support the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal so that we can keep our lights on and continue bringing you all of the powerful conversations with Black women and femme spiritual teachers, healers, lightworkers, shadow workers, mystics, and more. So there are a few ways that you can support the work of Black Girl Mystic. Number one, you can make a monthly contribution and join the Inner Circle community on Patreon. Memberships start at just $1 a month. When you're a Black Girl Mystic patron, you get behind-the-scenes conversations, extended interviews, book club discussions, discounts on courses, and offerings not available anywhere else. Sign up to be a monthly Black Girl Mystic sponsor at patreon.com slash blackgirlmystic. If a one-time contribution is more your speed, that's completely welcome too. You can make your contribution at paypal.me slash blackgirlmystic. One of the most powerful ways to support Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal is by spreading the word. Tell your girlfriends, sister friends, good Judies, and anyone else that you think would enjoy these powerful conversations that we have on the Black Girl Mystic podcast. And last but not least, you can subscribe and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Your rating makes it easier for folks to find us so that they can connect to the Black Girl Mystic magic as well. Thanks for being here, my love, and contributing to the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal. Peace and greetings, loved ones. Welcome back to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. This is gathering number 23, and I am so excited that you are here today. So today's conversation is actually going to be very different than any other conversations we've had on the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. We are talking to someone who is in corporate America in a very high C-suite position. She is not a healer in the way that we think about it traditionally. She's doing her work in a corporate environment. This is a conversation that I always want to have because if you know me, you know that is not where I thrive. And so I'm always curious about how Black women and femmes in particular are thriving and doing well and sustaining themselves holistically in environments such as corporate America that are explicitly and implicitly not built for us to thrive 
or be well-resourced. So today's conversation with Janine Uzel is so magnificent because she gives us a behind-the-scenes inner working of her own spiritual journey, of how she lives her faith, lives her path, and lives her values inside of corporate America. Janine Uzel is the Chief Operating Officer for the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit organization that runs the international conglomerate known as Wikipedia. Are you familiar with it? She is their Chief Operations Officer, and part of her job is working to evolve the organization's operations to match the growing, quickly growing needs and goals of the organization. She's originally from Newark, New Jersey, and she joined the foundation in early 2019. But before that, she was head of women in technology at GE, where she worked with the company's global CEOs to improve and cultivate culture across their workforce of over 300,000 employees, which accelerated the number of women in technical roles. And before that, She was the company's global director of external affairs and technology programs. And prior to that, she spent five years as the director of healthcare programs for GE Africa based in Accra, Ghana. She also served as the director of global healthcare programs, director of healthcare disparity programs, and the director of service operations for GE. Janine has nearly two decades of experience implementing the design and use of technology to drive impact on global outcomes. During her 16-year tenure at GE, she led multiple company-wide initiatives resulting in numerous culture shifts, new business models and products, and increased satisfaction. And to top it all off, in her spare time, Janine enjoys caring for horses, spending time with her 11 nieces and nephews, and weightlifting. One of the things I love most about this conversation is that Janine kept it all the way real about what it's like to be who she is right now in a global pandemic, and she did not sugarcoat it. It came straight from the heart, straight from the truth. I am so excited and deeply honored to share Janine Uzel with you. Welcome to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. How are you doing? Resiliency is, you know, I think it's what we, I think we, they put that in our DNA as Black yeah. women, we did it a little differently. Yeah. Um, but I can't say that it hasn't been at the expense of something. I don't know what. Um, mm. There are some things that I I believe, and I'm a hopeful, optimistic, and a great woman of faith. So I believe everything going to be all right. I also believe there is a price that we're going to pay, and mm. it's going to feel different for some of us. You know, I don't know what this is doing to our bodies, to our spirits, to our beings. I just don't know. And some of it may not show itself for a while. Yeah. And I don't know. Um, I am feeling challenged in my creativity. And then at the same time, I feel bold. And then there are days when I feel like I can't, you know, solve how to tie my shoe. And then there's other days when I feel like I can run a marathon. But I can't tell you what day that is. Mm-hmm. Like there are days when we're nailing it. And then there's the days that I'm the head of one of the top 10 websites in the world. and I can't get Skype to work. I mean, <laughs> and there's no, ego. no, you can't even bring ego into that. It just is what it is. That's exactly right. The, the polarities that you're describing are exactly it. The extremes mm-hmm. and yep. the unknown, yep. you, because it's like, you can be, like you said, COO of one of the top websites in the mm-hmm. world. And Skype is not going to work. You can't control everything, right? Okay. You can't, but I want to. I want to be like, no, you will work for me. <laughs> <laughs> the whole world is using Wi-Fi at the same time all day, every day right now. So I don't know what's happening. That's right. That's right. But, and there's a humility that comes from that because, um, I mean, as a Christian, I, I, you know, I'm like, God, I trust you to take care of my life, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need, but I need to control this. (laughs) You're going to work for me today. Yeah, no. 
and there's nothing I can, and there's a humility that comes with that because we are women that get the job done and there's nothing wrong with that. The con- the control of how we get it done and learning to maybe surrender some of that. I, I took a sabbatical uh, a year and a half ago before I joined Wiki and I called that time. I didn't call it when I went into it, but as I grew in my sabbatical, I started calling it the surrendered life. Mm. And uh, one of these days when I get a minute, I'm trying to take it to write about it. I've got a great book in me about the surrendered life. And, um, Every time something would go wrong, I would just laugh and be like, welcome to the surrendered life. I mean, because you have the whole, I have it planned perfectly. Of course. I, I am an ops leader. I can plan. And it came, the way I started saying that is that my mentor, nothing was working out for me. And she was just like, oh, that's so awesome. And I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Did you not hear what I said? She's like, no, I just, I love when, when things don't go the way we thought. That means something greater is even going to happen. So welcome to the surrendered life. So I was like, I'm done with you. But I'll, <laughs> I'll take that title and I'll run with it. <laughs> so. As we get started, are there any people, teachers, guides, ancestors, elders that you want to just invoke and bring into our conversation today? People who've been instrumental and valuable for you on your your life journey who you want to just name now? No, I honor God in everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that, um, you know, who I am is a reflection or is completely built on, on him being the source of my strength. And I've been a believer for my whole life. And, and I believe that God puts us in families and spaces and places that both elevate us and try us. Right. So, um, I come from a legacy, um, that is wonderful. My father is a member of the great migration that moved North and married my mom. Um, you know, and I have, I have the honor of knowing that, you know, I knew my grandfather on both sides. Both of them were Roberts, uh, Robert Reed, Robert Uzel. I didn't, I don't know anyone past that, but I've studied my Uzel side. And so my great grandfather, Abraham, my great, great grandfather, Abraham senior. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm invoking their presence. I only want to invoke the presence of the Holy spirit, but I do give honor to the legacy of who I come from because those folks, my great, great grandfather, uh, maybe I'll call him the Abby or something, but he was a slave, right? As far as I know. And, um, but even my dad, who was like a singer, you know, he was a doo wop singer, you know, sang for Cadillac Records and, 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 you know, just wanted to perform and do his thing and, you know, was a laborer, you know, when singing didn't make him the four tops or whatever, he was a laborer. And, um, they just wanted to have good kids, right? I, I was with my mom one day. I have a home in Florida. And I was like, Mom, did you ever imagine we might be doing this? And she was like, how could we? How could your father and I ever think that two people that came from poverty could have children? She, you know, we wanted to have kids and have them be good people. Mm. So, yes, we envisioned that. So like, well, we didn't envision degrees and then another degree and then a, this and then these companies and these jobs and the things that you do and you take me places and, and give me things. And she was like, no, we, that's not our, and you know, my father hasn't been alive to see it, but I, I, I am grateful because every day I'm sure they said no to something so that they can say yes to everything that we are today. That's a gospel word right there. That's right. That's right. Thank you. And, and I, I don't take that lightly. Legacy means everything to me. It's everything I talk about legacy. Yeah. And I hope I'll keep putting that into my cousins and my family members and all that. Thank you for, for that. It's so important because the migration story of Black folk who are the descendants of enslaved Africans who right. migrated out of chattel slavery, out of Jim Crow to the North on faith that they may never see the benefits. They may never reap the benefits of their sacrifice mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. so um, important to name. Yes. Because so so many of us, you know, you have an undergraduate degree, you have a graduate degree, you have a fancy title, you've had fancy titles for a long time, can just look at that and be like, oh, okay, she got it together. And we don't always contextualize or think about the sacrifice, the blood, sweat and tears, the faith, the, the devotion, the commitment, the consistency that our past generations made in order for us to just be here and create these lives. 
I don't take lightly that I am a black girl born in Newark, New Jersey, of parents that went to high school and loved each other and labored hard. Statistically, I am not supposed to be standing on the 11th floor of a building in Washington, D.C., where I live, looking out across the city. And, and that's not to brag. I'm saying I, under, I don't take it lightly at all. Yeah. Everyone, not only because society says I shouldn't be this, but because we all have an opportunity to choose. And no matter what my parents put into us, they tried, they tried to make sure we had dinner at the table every, every night with them. We were a family that did things that most black families don't do anymore. Mm. But I still had the option every day to go out there and make a different choice. And my dad used to say to me, and I don't know that women have men in their lives that say this to them. I'm not married. But my father used to say to me, you are Jay's daughter. Don't you ever forget that. And that came with a lot of pressure. People when I would go down south, you JD's daughter, you J because what that meant was, don't you mess this up. And if you do, you're still my daughter. But, you know, and so it, I had this commitment to be, and he never said, so you have to go do this or you have to go do that. He just was like, you have to honor who you are. That's right. whatever you, however you do it, whatever you think is the right thing to be. My father never once told me what I had to be or who I had to be. And that's freedom. That's, yeah. that's freedom. So take us back to Newark, New Jersey, being Jay's daughter. What were you like as a little one? What were you like as a little girl? So some of this is funny. I can remember um, I, when I had a, a milestone birthday, the last milestone birthday I had that my dad was alive for, I was 40. And so because I have video recording, I can remember hear him saying this when he was being taped. And he said that I would be like, daddy, can I have this? Daddy, that. Daddy, we got to do this. Daddy, daddy, daddy. I mean, I'm, I'm a daddy's girl all day. And, you know, I, I know for a fact I was very independent. Um, my mom used to tell me all the time for every... I, I carry, you know, both sides, like for every bit of, of warmth and cuddly I am, because I am the person in my family that says, I love you to everybody. And I hug and I kiss, but I'm also like, no, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. Don't help me. You know? So my mom's like, you always need extra time to get ready for school. Cause you're going to do it all yourself. You know, we want, you know, everything was, I can do it. I can do it. But I'm, I'm so emotionally attached to people. Sometimes my, my siblings to this day tease me and call me Velcro. <laughs> because I'm, because they were like, you're just so stuck to mommy and daddy. It's like Velcro. I was like, I don't care. I don't care. So I think that, um, you know, my parents, if they were describing me, they would say that um, I'm a very determined woman and that I've always been that way, that I've always been very compassionate and caring, um, but always very, very busy. Mm -hmm. And my dad would say, um, I've always, he's always said I've had more mouth than body. And I got a lot of body, so that's a lot of mouth. Um, I'm a talker, and um, I'm a communicator. Probably in my other life, if I wasn't an engineer, I thought I might be a journalist and a writer and want to have conversations with people because I love stories. Hmm. So, you know, I think my parents put in me a, a strong work ethic, a strong Christian ethic, and it's just a strong um, people ethic. And then the last thing I'll say is that I am a twin to my mother in terms of looks, but I am my father's personality 100%. <laughs> wow. Very cool. And so let's talk about, grow. you said you grew up in the church, you've been a person of faith your whole life. Yeah. When did you, because you, I grew up in the church too, and I was in church every Sunday, Sunday school every Sunday. It was, yeah. a, I was, grew up AME, so it was like very important socially for me. My Most of my community and friendships came from the church, um, and that we're in the church and also outside of the church. We all went to church together, but it wasn't all until I got older that I started to have a real personal relationship with God and a real spark that I was like, Oh, this is, this is all of that. And we can have a personal relationship. Right. I'm curious when for you, it became personal and it became intimate. For me, you know, this, the switch was from the fear of God to the fear and reverence of God, if that makes sense. Because I grew up, you know, just like you, in the church, Baptist church, choir, youth group, church. All that. I, my commitment 
commitment to Christ as a child, I know it was genuine. I know it was. I know I love God. I was afraid to. I was afraid to not love God. You know what I mean? Mm. I don't want to be in trouble. I don't want to go to hell. I just want to, you know. And then as I grew, uh, probably, you know, through high school and when I had a choice and I still chose God, you know, it's one thing when you're raised in the house and this is what you do on Sunday. Right. It's another thing when it's a choice. And when I got to college, I had a choice. <laughs> as long as I was in Kate's house, I was going to church. When I wasn't anymore and I'm at college and I still had the opportunity to explore, which I did as a college student, had a wonderful career and a wonderful life at, at North Carolina a and where I went to college, but I still chose God. And um, I found a fortitude in him and a peace that, that I knew I would take with me into my career because I always knew I was going to have a big career. I, I did not believe that my platform would be ministry. Hmm. Um, I felt like my career and the life that I was going to live was going to be ministry in itself. And that certainly shows itself now a bit when we can't even get to church, right? It's how we live and who we are and what we bring. And so I learned, I knew I was going to be an executive, a businesswoman. I didn't know where or how or what that was going to be. And I knew that I was going to be able to be good at it because I trusted God to make me, to help me to be good. And because I was smart, I was a hard worker and stuff like that. So I think that's when it became intimate for me. Um, when I began to pray and understand that prayer was something that I could do myself and not have to uh, have other people do for me. Um, when I started, you know, the first time you face hard things in life and, and you don't, you, for me, I, I went to prayer. I lost a grandparent. I lost, you know, when, when life begins to happen, yeah. you find that that's, you know, that's where you go into. And I, I, I carry that with me everywhere. It's in my, per- like the thread of, of who I am Spiritually is something that if you know me, everyone knows. And maybe you know it at different levels, but my CEO, CEO knows I'm a Christian or a woman. She might call it a woman of faith. She knows that when her best friend um, was, when there was an issue, she, you know, I said, hey, I'd like to know that person's name. I'd like to pray for them if that's okay. She knows that I'm going to mm. say something. Like that. She also knows that I know how to run a budget and operate a strategy and um, that I have integrity doing it. Ooh, so when you say I chose God, is that what you mean? You chose God. You chose that that was going to be what you resourced. That was what was going to support you instead of who knows what else. Like there's, yeah, I the belief that I had in God as a savior to be the constructor of my life. And I chose to surrender. Now, I didn't do all that surrendering until like yesterday. <laughs> right? Every day, for real. But I chose to surrender. And what that means for me, because it's different for every person. I'm never here to say what that means for one person. Because I choose a lot of things every day. I choose, you know, my lifestyle and the way that I live. And it is steeped in who I am as a woman of faith. I chose to be surrendered. And what that means for me is that I feel like the work that I do is purpose driven where he takes me. I I don't feel so obligated to say, this is my choice and this is what I do. I feel obligated to pray and to ask God to direct and guide and order me. And then when I'm in a situation, it's not, I'm not so quick to say, this is not, this is not what what I'm doing. I'm out. I feel if I'm called and I'm assigned, then there's some, Thing for me to do and to be until I feel released in it. So I do not believe that my life is my own. Mm-hmm. I believe it's ordered and led by God. You know, I get to decide what I want for breakfast, right? Maybe, right? I love that. I love that so much. I, I think it's so powerful that you're speaking about this and, and that you're speaking about it in this way. You know, I um, also am an HBCU graduate. I went to Spelman. Hey, all right. <laughs> Um, but for, and I worked in corporate America, I've worked in large nonprofits. It, those are not in places where I necessarily thrive. It's hard for me to, um, hold my center and have all of these external expectations of me in terms of like success. And so when I look at you, when you've been at GE 14 years, now you're 
Sorry, 16. 16. Every one of them years counts. 16. 16. <laughs> you were at GE 16 yeah. years. Everyone, absolutely, every one Ooh. of those years absolutely counts. <laughs> and now you're COO of Wikimedia. Okay, so Wikimedia is the nonprofit that runs Wikipedia. So, you know, Wikipedia, a resource that I hope you use and your listeners use every day. Uh, but there are a number of Wiki projects, but Wikipedia is the one that you experience the most. But an example of another one is like, hey, Siri, that data um. is sourced through Wikipedia, right? Hope it doesn't turn on when I said it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we are the foundation, the nonprofit that runs this. The reason we're a nonprofit is because Wikipedia is free knowledge and we operate a platform that is free we don't charge for it. We don't run ads on it. We don't track you when you come to Wikipedia, mm. which is why you can do searches on Wikipedia and not get an ad in your inbox the next day on something you read because we don't track that. OK. And the community that builds Wikipedia is a community of volunteers around the world that write the content and pull the news and the information that make the citations on our stories, which make Wikipedia relevant, not as your only source of information, but one of them. And it's made it, you know, Wikipedia will be 20 years old next year. And uh, it's one of the top 10 websites. I know there are some people like my nieces and nephews that have never known a world without Wikipedia. And uh, so 20 wow. years old. Wow. I love Wikipedia. I literally use it every day. <laughs> thank you. I love it. So thank you for, for sharing. So I'm curious as someone who 16 years at GE yeah. now in the C-suite at Wikimedia, how do, have you been able to stay connected to your soul, not get caught up in the push and pull of the external expectations of corporate America and still stay anchored in your soul, anchored in your relationship with God, anchored in your faith, because it's so, this is not necessarily the culture, right? This is not our dominant, like, societal culture, and it's not the culture of corporate America. So how have you been able to maintain that integrity with yourself? Yeah. Um, by messing it up a lot, probably. And by being so desperate that if not God, then what was going to happen? Um, the work that I do is hard. Mm. The C-suite is hard. And I'm sorry, there are not enough people of color, enough black women in the C-suite because I don't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> you need resources and people. And the work is hard. The environments are are hard and can be very emotionally draining. So, you know, I'm all for being a superwoman and then I get tired. And um, so maintaining that is has been vital to my ability to sustain in any of these spaces. I believe that the doors that have been opened for me and the, I mean, I've literally watched God move the way a multinational company does business so that I could go and do the work that he wanted me to do, mm. which was the work that I, I mean, who knew that I could be this girl from Newark living in Africa, bringing access to healthcare to people all around the world. And, you know, the things that I could have never thought for, I, I don't want to take any of that for granted. So when I didn't do a good job at maintaining my center, there was mercy. So I'm not trying to mess that up. Um, now I understand it. I understand it better. I'm older now. I'm more mature, right? I'm more mature in my age and my spiritual experience in my career. I'm also human. But now when I, when I have these negative experiences in the workplace, I'm like, I want to just be, I want to choke someone. I don't know if I can say that on your show, but I do. I want to, but I know the right thing for me to do is to be who I know know I'm supposed to be as a representation, uh, um, as a servant leader. And so that means that um, I have to show up differently. The world is counting on the people that call themselves of the spirit to show up differently, right? The Bible even says that there, there's this groaning and expectation for us to be um, the sons of God. So I have to show up differently. Sometimes the people don't even know that that's what they need. I just know, and I don't always know that that's what they need. It's just when it works, you have to know that that was the right thing. And so 
It's not always about me feeling that way. It's about knowing it is the right way. And the, the, the opportunity or what it takes to sustain that means that it, it means just as much in nurturing and watering who you are spiritually. I believe the same physically in terms of my fitness and my health as it does the work that I put into studying how we're going to do OKRs or having um, conversations with other people to understand best practices and honing that skill and sharpening it. It all, to me, it all ties together. I need my family. I love, you know, my siblings and my nieces and nephews and my cousins. We're very close. When I don't, don't have time with them, I feel drained. When I don't have time spiritually, I feel drained. When I don't have time physically, I feel drained. You know, and then look, when I'm not working, I feel drained too because I love the workplace. I love that too. So all of that kind of makes up, I guess, what you say, my my soul being. Mm, beautiful. When you, your your hashtag on Twitter is isolated extrovert. <laughs> my staff named me that. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you are mean by being an, a black woman? There's not a lot of black women in the C-suite. What do you mean by that? So isolated extrovert came about because of COVID when we went into isolation. So, and they're, they're like, so they often call me the chief extrovert officer and they're like, how are you doing? And I was like, I can't take isolation. So they started calling, they, they were checking in on our isolated extrovert. But it's interesting how you took a different spin on it. Because it was strictly like a mock on me being cooped up by myself for COVID when I thrive off of the energy of people. But there's a whole nother spin you put on that. And it's that there's such a small number of, of black women in the C-suite that the number of people that you can communicate with, not because you can't talk to everyone, but when you're in it, you're, you're solving problems that are like minded. And sometimes you need to talk to somebody that is in it to help you work through it. And so you can feel very isolated. And if you're an extrovert, it just stinks all the way around because, you know, you're feeling very controlled or contained, you know, when you want to kind of flourish. It's like putting a pot, you know, when you have to repot something, it grows out or it's, or it's stifled. I feel like, you know, I'm in this pot and I'm trying to break out. Yeah. And break out of this space too. <laughs> Because on one hand, it's like celebrated and it looks great on paper and it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's like something to be recognized. And at the same time, like you said earlier, it can do some serious impact and we may not necessarily know what it takes to sustain and survive and thrive in a pot when you need to be planted on the earth, right? Like, so how do you sustain yourself? How do you nourish yourself in that way? I write because I love stories, so I write them. I don't write enough. Um, I definitely pray. But God knows that I need people too. And so in, in this time of COVID, where we're all isolated, it's been a lot harder. But that's where I also know who I am spiritually is, is breaking through. Because in and of my own resolve, I'd be having a breakdown right now. But because of who God is, he's restoring and refreshing that in ways that I don't have the capacity to do myself, no matter how much I'm exercising or talking to friends or but it's, it's, I don't have, I don't know how I've survived. But I don't know. Yeah. And I know that that in and of itself is um, testimony to that, especially with the critical work that's been put in my hands during this time, scenario planning, because we have to, you know, retract or, or re- shift um, the budget that we're up. It's budget season for us. And, you know, with COVID trying to, to create scenarios of how we will sustain and ensure that the mission and the platform and the staff are all maintained. I mean, there's been four months of that and now it's budget planning. It's been a nonstop flow of work. So um, it is not any good of my own for sure that I am able to kind of be here and have, a decent train of thought and um, mm. and be able to communicate that. So I'm very grateful. Uh, thanks for, for reminding me of that. Yeah, yeah, it's powerful. And it's, it's because especially because there's, there are so few black women occupying this space. It's like, we really need to know, you know, so so if someone is listening to this, who's in corporate America, or in nonprofit in a way that like big nonprofit, right? A black woman who 
isn't quite sure how to sustain herself, isn't quite sure how to deepen that connection with God, what would you want her to know? What would you want to tell her? I would want her to know that not only is God fully available to you, but he is counting on you to count on him. And you are not the only person that suffers when you choose not to lean into God. Everything around you, every task that he's placed in your hand, from the people that you're working with to the future that you want to design to, you know, for your career or otherwise, he already has it all laid out and you're going to delay it, which means there are people that are waiting for you to show up and be that will be delayed in something else. There are, there's so many things tied to our being. And there are days when I'm showing up and I'm like, I have to remind myself, it's not just about me. When you decide that you want to take on this journey, whether it's the journey in your career, the journey in being a representation of the kingdom, any of the, or both of them together, wow, he's counting on you to count on him. He's like, you don't have to do this by yourself. You are just making this so much harder than it has to be. Um, and so I would want her to know that he is available. And he has this thing called a yoke. And I read recently something that said, life is hard, but God's yoke is easy. Mm. And the mm. way that the yoke was described was they were like, it was like, it's two cattle walking side by side with each other. And you have this huge yoke. It's like wearing a, like a weighted barbell around your neck. And there's two links to it, one for you and one for God. And yours is like not even hooked to you. It's just all loose around your neck. You don't even know it's there because he's carrying the weight of it. It's kind of like if you have a tandem bicycle and the kid's on the back of the bike and he's not really pedaling. His pedaling doesn't have anything to do with making the bike move. The dad's doing all the work. That's what the yoke is. It's like, I'm doing all the pedaling. Your stuff is there just for decoration. It's going to flow whether you, all you have to do is come along. Yeah. And so the hard problems, the hard life, the difficult situations, the tough colleagues, the decisions that you'll have to make. Do you know what it's like when you have to sign your name at the end of an agreement for a top 10 website in the world that says you are confirming that the budget is clear and this is this is accurate and this response. And, and my name is on there, which means my family's name is on there. That's mm -hmm. a lot of responsibility. And God is like, that's heavy, but you don't have to worry about that because I got the yoke. I got the weight of it. And so that's the example that I would want your listener for her to know if she's in this space. And, and even if she's not in the career space, it's the same for all of us that choose to trust it, whether you take on a take it into your career or just take it into your day to day life. Yeah. Ooh, it's so true. It's so true. I think American culture in particular is so individualistic mm -hmm. that we think it's just me. I can do this. I can do this on my own. I, I'm a, the hyper achiever. And, and that yoking though is the key. It's the game changer. It's like the secret sauce. You know, it's like, it's how everything actually happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really the, the truth. It's not our individualistic push and go and drive. Like, I think it's important to be in service to that, right? To be obedient to that, mm -hmm. even though obedience gets a bad rep. But it obedience does, but is my favorite thing. Yeah, people akin obedience to like slavery and bondage, and it's not. Obedience is, is the, the twin to surrender. Yes. You know, it's like it's first cousin or whatever, because you can't be surrendered and not obey. That's right. When you try, when you choose to wear it like it's a, a burden or um, a lesser than of who you are, then uh, you're, you're just seeing it in the wrong light because that means you're looking at obedience as if it were being beaten upon you and, you know, pushing you down into something that's very negative and abusive. But there's a freedom in obedience because that means you're like kicked back two legs up. I'm good. You got this. I'm just following that's exactly it. And when people can learn to trust that and be in choice, like then life is golden mm -hmm. because it doesn't become about appearances. It doesn't become about optics. It doesn't become about what things look like. It's like deep soul level trust yeah. means like really then you can, like you said, kick back and just enjoy the fruits of the bounty. 
The challenge in that is that once you get free and other people aren't, they will constantly be trying to put their own things that they're bound by on you. So you could be like, that doesn't phase me anymore. Well, how could it not? <laughs> well, then what's wrong with you? I'm good. Right. And, and those are those are that's a hard thing. It's like a shedding of of something that can be very difficult because then you're like, but no, remember when we used to think the same and roll the same and we're cool. It's like you still want that. But you're like, but this piece right here is, doesn't give me pause or, or yoke me up at all. It's not. E- but it's not easy. And the reason it came to mind is because I'm going through something like that right now. So I, I get it because I'm mm-hmm. experiencing it. So without disclosing the details, with this thing that you're like in the middle of right now, what is your daily practice or your daily reminder? Like, how do you bring yourself back to surrender and obedience? Well, one, I do have a coach, um, like a life coach, someone that I talk to, and we don't talk to her every day. That would cost a lot. No, um, <laughs> I don't talk to her every day, but um, she also is a friend. And so I do have one or two people that I reset with. Mm. So that's necessary. And then I keep a list and it's called my why list and why W H Y. And it's my why list. There's two, there's some different things on that list. The main part of the list is why I feel God has called me to be like, what, why he's put me here. Why am I at Wikipedia? And all of the reasons why, and, and why I'm here, like, and also because I wanted this and I asked, I asked for this and, and, and look how it showed up. The list of my whys is really important because on any given day, you want to do something different or be in a different space. And I have to be reminded until I'm not no longer feeling called to this, then my why is, is how I keep myself grounded. The second piece, and this is me specifically, I'm very clear on the purpose of how my career is used specifically. Mm. And that is, I have a very specific mandate. It consists of three things. God has called me to learn, to lead, and then to leave. And the leaving is the hardest part because I am such um, an emotionally attached person. But that is how in 16 years I had like five different jobs on five different continents, you know, on different continents around the world and different cities. I move a lot. And um, that has been tougher for me because I get connected and then I don't want to go anywhere. I want to just be, I just want to like, no, you do my hair and you're my lunch person and we hang and, and God moves me a lot. But it's because he's given me the resiliency to, to be in that he's given me a love for the world and he's given me a message that has to travel to multiple locations. So I get into places, I learn them, I lead them through it. And then I leave. I never know when I don't know how long I'll be learning. I don't know how long I'll be meeting and I don't know when I'm going to leave, but, but I know when it's time. And <laughs> my list of why is what I always go back to. And I look at it and I'm like, yep, it's done. We're going. So those things keep me moving in the good, but mostly in the bad. Because when things are what, the way that I don't want them to be, I have to go back and remind myself, this, you're, this is bigger than you. And this wow. Is bigger than you. wow, that's so powerful. That's such a powerful, powerful practice. And I think those two parts are so essential because giving yourself permission to leave is invaluable. So many people stay in terrible situations because they don't one have their why list they don't know why they're there or they are only have their why list and they're they don't they're like this is what i'm supposed to do and they don't give themselves permission to leave when it's time to go even if it's not terrible and the time has just come to an end it's important to be able to have that permission to go on to the next appointment or assignment or calling or whatever it is that's next for you So let's talk about this a little bit, because I know you call yourself a global citizen, that you lived in Ghana for five years. I am also a world traveler and global citizen. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear more about your travels, where you've lived, what you've done, um, and your favorite places. Please tell us. Uh, Favorite places are easy, because my favorite places are wherever people that I love and care about are, and where we're having, like, my, my wants are pretty simple. We got to have good food. I don't want to cook it. I bring the best wine ever because I bring wine from all over the world. And we sit and 
hours and hours of just laughing and talking and fellowship. And that's because I do travel so much and I do work so hard. So entertainment for me is not a lot. I don't need a lot. Mm. It's just who I'm with for sure. Um, places. Africa is my second home. Right. So I'm a girl from Jersey that thinks she's a Ghanaian and, um, and, and the Ghanaians would agree. With me, so they accept me. Um, love Ghana. Still go there all the time. Would be there now if it weren't for COVID. So that's like a second home to me. But and Sub-Saharan Africa, where I spent, you know, years I've been traveling in, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa since 2008. So I love it all. But I have my favorites. Some of my my favorite places are where I've had the best experiences like Rwanda, when I happened to be in Rwanda during a time where the people who had been incarcerated for the killings uh, during the genocide were being released. It had been a 15 year period of time, just had to be five, six years ago maybe. And what the communities or the villages were doing was that the people that had been convicted would, would come into the village. And I experienced, I actually went to one of these dinners and they're around a, a fire and a pot and there's rice and there's food and they are eating and they are eating dinner with the people that had killed members of their families. And there's so many killings. You don't know exactly who you killed during the genocide, but the person stood up and he said, my name is, and I am of this tribe Hutu and during the genocide, I killed many people in this village and I'm sorry. And then they would serve rice and eat together. I was like, oh no, Mm -mm." I learned a lot about forgiveness there. So Rwanda, I mean, how, and I remember this old woman touching my face. I was like, how did you do that? And she held my face in her hand and she said, my daughter, this is our home and this is all we have. So we must forgive. So I love Rwanda, right? I could tell you a story like that for almost every place that I've been. Some of them are hilariously funny. I'll tell you one. I was in, um, where was I? Uh, Bangladesh. And um, we were in a a meeting in a village and they had experienced um, a great drought during this time. And during the time I was in the meeting, these people were assembling outside our travel guide came in and said, we need to leave. And we were like, the meeting's not over. We were meeting with some people to talk about some healthcare and all. They were like, we need to get um, this woman, that's how they would refer to me, out quickly. Evidently, there had been a bit of a coup brewing in the in the village when they saw me come in. And remember, there are no black women coming to rural Bangladesh, right? I worked in rural communities. I wasn't always in the city. I was in the cut. They had never even seen a black person before. They thought that maybe I was a witch that had brought on the drought and they were coming to overtake me. I can't make this up. It happened. They snuck me out of a door, put me into the van and drove me out while the villagers were like chasing me for real. I might've been like steak for dinner. I don't even know what they were planning, but I was someone that they had never seen before. They had never seen a woman that looked like me. Some of these places, they don't have television. Some of the rural places where I were work, was working for healthcare were very different than many of your listeners may have, may have ever experienced, right? So they were like, we have a drought. And they were told by their priestess person that it was because of a witch. So when I got, they were like, well, she doesn't look like us, so she must be it. But I still love me some Bangladesh. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I'm telling you, I have some of the best stories, which is why I go back to like what I was saying to your listeners earlier, like this, that, that's what obedience is. Obedience gets you to Bangladesh. Not, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's like, we need somebody to do this. And God allowed an entire multinational to turn the way it does business as a major, we build huge hospitals and put big equipment in it that make tons of money. We do not do rural handheld ultrasound that's gonna barely have us break even to save the lives of women. That's not what we do, but that's what I talked about. And that's what we got a chance to do. And they were mm. like, you're crazy. I want to go out there and do it. I was like, sign me up. <laughs> you know, and I spent my 10 years of my career G, doing that work, building it, defining it, and then delivering on it. And I'll be forever, ever, forever changed because of my experiences around the world. Beautiful. I, I want to hear about your relationship with horses. <laughs> so um, I love horses. My dad said, 
daddy can have a horse. That, that. He would tell you that's what I said all the time. And and my understanding is I found this out after he died. This man actually tried to get me a horse and, you know, the, the city wouldn't allow us to have it there. But he was trying to find a place where it could stay and all kinds of stuff I found out he was trying to figure out. But um, I have a few experiences. I don't know why I love horses. I'm not, I've never had a pet before. Um, I, my, my mom didn't like, like them, but, um, I love horses. The first time I ever got on a horse, I might've been seven or eight. I was at rocking horse dude ranch in upstate New York. And my dad was a member of a group called the outdoorsmen. And these were, these were black men that ski They're They're part of the national brotherhood of skiers, a black ski group. They camped and did all kinds of stuff that my, my father was into. So we did it. And, um, we were at this ranch and my uncle um, put me on a horse. The The horse threw me. I flew off. Oh. My mom was screaming. My dad picked me up and put me back on the horse and I've been riding ever since. Um, I liked to go fast. Um, I first learned how to ride without a saddle. So I was a wild rider. <laughs> yep. My dad would put a bandana around me and just <laughs> let me go. What? I eventually uh, took formal English lessons and actually learned how to properly tack a horse, uh, which is the, the entire process of cleaning, brushing, saddling. That's called tacking a horse. Um, I've learned how to do that. And you don't always learn that because most like tacking a horse is like maybe letting somebody drive your, your, your top of the line or you don't let people touch your stuff like that. So most people, if, if you ride at a stable, you might ride a horse, but they don't people that own the horse don't want you to tack. It, but um, I have found people that let me do it because it's, you have to stay in practice and do it. Um, I've had some fun experiences with horses, like from a leadership perspective. Um, I was at a ranch once and took a leadership course. Funny how we keep coming back to surrender and obedience here. But some some of your listeners may have seen this practice on television. It was on a, a TV show once, I understand, where you have to kind of connect with the horse. Lifting a horse's foot when it doesn't want to move is impossible. It's planted. You got thousand pounds of girth there. It's not lifting. But if you properly can, this involves coming in the proper minds. You have to let go of all your, your anxiety. You have to be very calm and relaxed. The peace that it takes to make this happen is why I couldn't do it many times. Mm. And then we finally got to it. And it's bringing your calm self and teaches you how to connect to a person, basically speaking their language, putting your hand on the horse, kind of touching it, rubbing it, and then you can lean down. And if the horse trusts you and feels a connection to you, you can lift the horse foot up. If you do it right, you can take the hoof off, put a hoof back on, and, you know, a horseman can do that with a lot of, I mean, they have a different relationship, but to have a person do that that's not, a person that's working in the stable, a regular person that they're around, it's almost impossible. And um, I didn't do it the first couple of times, but eventually I did get it to happen. And it's, it's rare. But um, you, I wrote a story called Lessons Learned from a Horse. And um, it was all, it's literally about surrender, obedience, because the instructor was like, listen to me, hmm. and then listen to the horse and do what it says. And the horse is basically like rigid until, until I chill. And then it chill, and then wow! There's so many lessons in what we're talking about with just surrender and obedience here today. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I I have been on horses and ridden horses, but I've never developed that kind of relationship with a horse. And I just know that they it can be so healing. Like so many people have profound healing relationships with horses, or mental health uh, challenges, or people who are incarcerated have like there's so many ways that horses have been used to soothe the soul like you're saying and bring peace because like and it just goes back to like you don't know what god has for you when he puts you in something i just liked that they went fast i was like this is awesome (laughs) um i also know that when you don't follow when you don't obey when you don't do what you're supposed to there's ramifications i was brushing a horse and you know i know very specifically that if you're brushing I'm using my right hand, my dominant hand to brush. I have to hold the head so that, you know, they're focused on something else in case, you know, you hit a bump. Mm. And I wasn't doing that. And I'm just brushing and doing my thing. And he came right around and bit me right in the side. 
I must have hit a tender spot or something. And all of a sudden, I just was like buckled into my knees and screaming. He had just took a nice little right in me. You know what I mean, he's just like, it's not my fault. You can do what you're supposed to do. You're in my space, you know, hurting me, do, do the right thing. Wow. Yeah, I never did that again, for real. <laughs> how, how was it? Did he take a chunk out? Not a chunk, but he broke the skin and enough where I got to go and you got to, you know, you get a shot. And for I have so many meds in me from all my global inter- interfaces that they're always like, you're fine. <laughs> wow. Well, as we close our conversation today, what would you say your message is? What do you want to leave the listeners with? What is the message that you're here to share with the world? Mm. Well, the first would be that the life that I've been blessed to live is not just for me, but for anyone that would choose to follow their journey and stay surrendered. And I don't know what that is for any person. So, but it's very possible. You know, I'm sure, you know, if we look at statistics, a black girl from Newark is probably not supposed to be doing some of these things, right? Mm-hmm. But I had a choice and I made some choices. And so I, I, I say that because we don't see enough of black women like yourself, like myself, that are in places where other people are like, I didn't even know that was possible. I certainly didn't have anybody telling me this was possible. My father said anything's possible. Well, my dad didn't know what this looked like either. Right? Yeah. Here is, you're my daughter, so anything's possible. What's possible, I don't even know. Uh, so the first one is that. The second one is that I would say is it's so important for me, if I can leave this with you, is that you leave people better than you found them. I want people to know I was there. And I want when they say I was there for them to say I'm better because she came. And then my leaving won't be in vain. Mm. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you so, so, so much for this conversation. I've loved talking to you. If folks want to connect with you or follow up, where is the best way for them to find you? I would love for people to follow me on Twitter. Uh, I think it's at Janine Uzel, right? I think uh, J A N. N-E-E-N-U-Z-Z-E-L-L. Uh, that's certainly the place. And I also use my first and last name for my Instagram as well. But you want to see some great cool pictures of my niece and nephews and my mom Instagram. But my thoughts and, um, you know, my messages, I'm, I'm a tweeter. I tweet all day. So that's where I kind of hit the revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine. So much love for you. I'm wishing you the best. I'm wishing you safety. I'm wishing you peace and I'm wishing you power. Ooh, I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. You You're welcome. Thank you for being part of the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal. It's been an honor to have you in this sacred space. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe, review, and leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Your support helps other mystics just like you find our portal and community. Speaking of, if you'd like to stay connected and go even deeper, find me over on Instagram and say hi at Laren Alta, L-E-R-I-N, A-L-T-A. That's L-E-R-I-N-A-L-T-A. And so for now, we close this beautiful portal until we decide to meet again. Thank you so much for being here. So much love. Signing off. Oh, today.